And so good afternoon and welcome to November's Ballotpedia Insights. I'm Sarah Rozier. I'm Ballotpedia's Director of Outreach. And as you guys may know, the Insights is our bi-monthly Q&A sessions with political and legal scholars, researchers, reporters, and subject matter experts. Um, each installment, we host a new speaker or speakers as we have today and ask them tailored questions just, to des just designed to gain in-depth uh, knowledge into their work. So I also want to remind everybody, just as we get started, that I am always soliciting new ideas for participants and books. And we would like to know what you want to hear more about. Have you read a recent book that kind of tickled your fancy regarding the political atmosphere? Or is there somebody that you know or have heard of that might be a good candidate for this? So we pride ourselves at Ballotpedia on our neutrality, but we love digging into how others are relating to today's political climate. And today's call is definitely no different. So this is a topic that we discuss a lot at Ballotpedia, which is neutrality and what facts, do facts matter? What facts are important? How do we cover a topic neutrally? to make sure that we're not alienating anybody on either side. And so today we have the authors of the book, One Nation, Two Realities, Dueling Facts in American Democracy. And with us, we have the authors and professors, Morgan Marietta and David, David Barker. And um, according to the book, da book jacket, Marietta and Barker reach a number of enlightening and provocative conclusions. Dueling fact perceptions are not so much a product of hyper-partisanship or media propaganda, as they are of simple value differences and deepening distrust of authorities. So before I introduce the authors, just a reminder that you can always on Zoom or on Facebook, go ahead and ask a question if anything that they say brings something to mind and, and we'll get it answered at the end of the call. Um, so Dr. Marietta st studies the political consequences of belief. He is an American politics professor and the author of four books an editor of the annual SCOTUS series on the major decisions of the Supreme Court, and co-author of the Inconvenient Facts blog at Psychology Today. Dr. Barker is a professor of government and director of the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. He has authored and co-authored over 80 publications, including three books, this being one of them. His current research program seeks to identify the sources of productive political negotiation and compromise. So welcome to Ballotpedia Insights. Thanks Thank for having us. Yeah. Great. So I'd like to start with just a general overview. What premise prompted you both to dig into this research? And we'll go ahead and start with you, Morgan. Yeah, I guess we should say that um, Dave and I started thinking about this way back in about 2010. A lot of people now are interested in alternative facts and these problems of perception, really mostly about Trump. It started in 2015, 2016. Um, uh, Dave and I don't think this is about Trump. He, he didn't cause or bring this about. He's, he's riding a certain set of waves uh, that created what he's doing. But we started thinking about it back in uh, 2010 uh, and wondering why it was that there was so much developing evidence about things, say, climate change, and yet opinion was not shifting on it. The public opinion scholars will tell you that perceptions of climate change were staying pretty static as the information was developing. And we started to think that it applied to a lot of different things. Uh, and then we started to think that maybe this was a new form of polarization, not just the ideological and the religious and cultural and media polarization, geographic and wealth polarization, and every other kind we have that interweaves. This was a third or fourth stage of polarization of perceptions of reality. Uh, and some other people started to write and think about this. Uh, Jennifer Hookshield and uh, Catherine Einstein wrote a book on this. Uh, called Do Facts Matter in 2015, uh, laying out the overview of this. And what Dave and I wanted to do was take a deep empirical dive into this, put together five years of survey data, did a bunch of experiments, uh, did a bunch of follow-up studies, measured things every way that we could think of to measure things, uh, and came to a lot of very pessimistic conclusions that we'll <laughs> talk to you about. Yeah. yeah, and let me just add to that because um, you know, I was one of the people who was surprised by our own findings in, in some respects. I uh, started studying misinformation, actually, uh, back in the late 1990s. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I started studying partisan media and the, the persuasive impact of partisan media. And if you're going to study the persuasive impact of partisan media, you have to deal with misinformation. Uh, in the interim years, a lot of people started studying misinformation. Uh, but what Morgan really uh, started talking to me about 
is that, hey, uh, this problem is bigger than misinformation. It's not necessarily just about uh, who is right and who is wrong and keeping a scorecard of that, uh, but rather the, the general psychological tendency to project uh, one's beliefs and values onto one's fact perceptions, which uh, leads to these um, you know, dueling realities. Uh, and, and so again, it's in part of it is misinformation, but part of it also is just unwarranted certainty about things for which there are not clear, uh, cut and dried, true and false, black and white factual answers. That's a lot of the stuff that we argue about in American politics. And so we just wanted to explore this, uh, dynamic in a, in a broader way than anybody, than anybody else had previously. It's such an important distinction that you're making between this idea of misinformation and fake news, and then when somebody is just given facts, that they can draw vastly different conclusions, even if they're both looking at the exact same set of information. It's, I think they are two distinct things, and that's why this book is, is so critical to, to just framing today's, today's politics. Um, so before we really dig into some of these topics, I'd like to get and give our listeners just some basic keyword definitions that you use throughout the books. So one of them being the dueling fact perceptions. Can you define that? And then are there other words that you think are just critical to understanding kind of the conclusions that you end up drawing? So I'll turn it over to Dave for this. Okay. Oh, whoever. <laughs> uh, well, let me start out. I want to say something about the difference between truth and facts. Uh, and there's a lot of elements of that. I think Dave will want to add in something else. Uh, what you were saying about the difficulty of calling something true information and misinformation is one of the first things that we realize that that is not at all as easy as people think it is. Uh, we decided very early, uh, we're uh, uh, somewhat experts in survey methods and political psychology and these experiments, but we're not experts on these individual things. We're not arguing which ones are true and false. And it's actually very difficult to do so. If you, if you take something like uh, uh, is marijuana dangerous? Or is the national debt really destructive? You'll find very quickly that the experts are deeply divided on these things, especially about the national debt. Economists will tell you that they do not agree about whether the national debt is a deep problem or not. But different citizens and politicians will give you very strong, and as Dave will tell you, overly certain views that it's definitely the devil or it's definitely not a problem at all. And I think one of the big things here is if you distinguish between truth and facts, just straight out of the gate, truth is what really exists in the world. We don't have access to truth. One, uh, from the beginning of political science and philosophy, we've recognized we don't have direct access to that. We have facts. Facts are not truth. Facts are social approximations of the truth that are the best that humans can get at it. Uh, we give a really specific definition in the beginning of the book uh, that facts are. Um, what appears to be empirically true, grounded in the best available evidence, endorsed by authoritative institutions. And if you have the best available evidence and it's endorsed by institutional actors, we call that fact. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's right. right? A lot of facts are overturned over time. Uh, and a lot of things we simply don't have facts, but people will believe with certainty that we do. Which is, why, which is why we then distinguish between facts and fact perceptions, uh, because they're, while, we, while facts are not necessarily, uh, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence between the facts and truth, as Morgan just said. Uh, there are, however, a, a single set of facts that society recognizes at any given time as the best approximation of that truth, uh, and they're ob objective and they're verifiable, uh, and you can observe them. Um, however, right, people perceive those facts very differently. Uh, and so a dueling, the, the dueling fact perceptions phenomenon is this fact, or <laughs> is this, um, yeah, this fact uh, that, uh, that people uh, from different sides of the political divide tend to perceive uh, facts quite differently uh, and to be quite angry uh, about it, uh, hence the duel. Yeah, I mean, as, as you were going over this, I am thinking about getting a paleo person who eats grass-fed beef in the same room as a vegan and debating whether or not meat is healthy or not. 
<laughs> and it's, you know, they both use studies, they both have the, the facts, um, and you probably leave that room far more con confused than when you entered it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and another, term, another term that's worth mentioning uh, that uh, doesn't really show up uh, as much in our, our book, but it's something that we're working on now, uh, and so it's worth talking about uh, and defining, is intellectual hubris. And so we think that this is this is what underlies uh, some of these dueling fact perceptions and and the uh, unwarranted certainty uh, that goes on 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 both sides. Uh, people tend to be hubristic, right, or overly confident uh, about um, their ability to know uh, the objective truth when it comes to to a lot of stuff uh, and their um, their understanding uh, of the best evidence on that at any given time and. Interestingly enough, uh, we're going to get into this more later, um, but such hubris uh, tends to correspond to higher, not lower, levels of education. Interesting. Interesting. Now, are there any other terms that you think would be valuable for our listeners to know about uh, before we dig in? I think that's good enough for okay. now. Great. Yeah, you know, let me just say one. Um, we may say a good bit later uh, uh, about a theory Dave and I came up with that we refer to as intuitive epistemology. Right. Epistemology is one of those great terms that we ought to define, yeah. that it's the, the foundations or the reasons why people believe things, the uh, legitimate or sometimes illegitimate methods that people use to know. Once you realize that knowing is pretty hard, uh, believing is easy and knowing is hard, and people substitute believing for knowing. But epistemology, uh, we use a lot, that term a lot for the method or approach that people use to define something. Uh, when we talk about fact checking, uh, we did a lot of thought about the epistemology, the process that fact checkers use. It's not as legitimate as fact checkers say it is. Uh, once you start thinking about epistemology as a method that might well be flawed to know the world, uh, it starts to really change how you see all this. Yeah, fascinating. So what do you view as the core causes of just uh, everything, uh, everything we've just been discussing? What's uh, caused this? Yeah, so let me go ahead and, and jump in here because it, it relates to what I was saying before. And, and uh, again, it was one of the real eye openers uh, for, for me uh, as we did this, this work. And so based on my, my old work right, that I referenced a minute ago that uh, examined partisan media, uh, we expected uh, this to really be primarily a, a, a top-down uh, type of dynamic where partisan leaders right, and, um, and their minions uh, in the media were essentially telling people false stuff, right? Uh, and people were believing it. Uh, and, and hence, people were becoming misinformed. And, and because we have partisan media on, on both sides and, and uh, polarized leaders, right, in, in Congress and, and in the executive branch as well, we expected to, you know, see these dueling fact perceptions just come out of the fact that that's what, you know, the people that we look to um, to tell us what to think, that they tell us and we believe it. Um, it turns out, though, that while those factors are not unimportant, uh, they're not irrelevant, and indeed they're, they're not even unimportant, um, the, the deeper uh, driving mechanism that seems to, to, to shape all of this is within ourselves, right? It's not somebody else telling us uh, what to think, it's our own uh, values uh, that we project, that we choose to project. And so the, the again, you know, and, Either we can or we, we don't have to either way talk about all the specific evidence on this. But at the end, we conclude that, you know, if there had never been any such thing as Fox News and there had never been any such thing as Facebook, we would still find ourselves uh, in this same uh, position with respect to dueling facts and, and um, uh, uh, alternative uh, facts. Yeah. yeah, one of the ways Dave and I really see this differently from how a lot of other scholars do uh, is that we think it's much more entrenched. It's much more driven, as Dave's saying, um, from the bottom up than from top down. One of the first terms for this that came out in the literature was partisan facts. And that is actually defining it, giving it a term based on its origins, based on the causation. Uh, and we didn't want to just assume that that's what it was. That's why we use this term doing fact perceptions. That's just the clean term for what's happening. What's causing it? That's a completely different uh, piece of business. And if it is caused by people's internal values, which have become deeply polarized, and Dave and I also uh, mentioned this in the book, that none of this would have happened if we had not been deeply culturally polarized about our value systems. But because we are, and people 
um, look at the world in such different ways about what they want to see, about what is motivating them. Uh, motivated reasoning is one of the terms that psychologists use on this. That um, because it is so deep seated in our value divides, that's one of the reasons why it's so entrenched. If it were just uh, partisans acting or media acting, you could try to reform it in some way. Uh, if it's really driven by people's very core values that they are habitually projecting onto reality, uh, that explains the second half of the book, which is that it's very difficult to correct. Yeah. And let me uh, just uh, add another thing back in on this, again, uh, to perhaps make the distinction even cleaner, right? Rather than thinking of this as a dynamic where, you know, uh, propagandists tell people what to think, uh, it's more that um, propagandists can't tell people what to think, uh, even the people who are spreading true propaganda, right? I mean, I, I suppose maybe that's a contradiction in terms, but the point being that like people decide what they want to believe is true based on their identities uh, and their values, which, you know, coincide. Uh, and then when uh, somebody tells, when they hear something that, that goes along with that, they say, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, but when somebody else tells them something that uh, contradicts that, and that thing can be either true or false, right? That can be actual um, correct information or it can be propaganda. Either way, uh, it's not very effective uh, at changing uh, what people uh, believe based on what they want to believe. So this is, uh, I'm just tying it back in. This is finally clicking in my mind. I've been talking to different organizations who are trying to um, turn out low propensity voters who have specific issues that are at the top of their list. And the new tactic, I think it, I think it dovetails perfectly with, with what you guys are talking about. The new tactic is not to say, here's what all the candidates think on this issue that you care about, and so then you have to go out and vote because it's so critical. Yeah. The tactic is you don't say anything about the issue. They already know what they think about the issue. They are, these voters with low propensity to actually get on the vote already will know who to vote for once they do their research. But the tactic is just encourage them, encouraging them to go vote, almost shaming them to go vote. And I think this dovetails well because yep. it's already entrenched. Yeah. You can't change what people think. Yeah. 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 You can't activate them to really be mad at the other side. <laughs> right. <laughs> About the, uh, the, the uh, uh, not the positive partisanship, but the negative kind that they des yeah. desperately don't want. And it's not just don't want the other tr uh, side in charge. They don't want the other side's facts to be accepted as facts. Yeah, so interesting. So let's talk about some other consequences of this. Oh, yeah. Societally, yeah. what do you think are the main consequences? And then I'd like to get into specific political issues, just generally. Yeah, yeah. let me say a word about this and then uh, uh, Dave would be great to talk about um, the infamous Bob studies, uh, yeah. which tell you a lot about the social dynamic. Uh, and the argument there is that there's the normal political ones, but they're also very um, not necessarily obvious social ones. Dave will talk about in a moment. Uh, the, the political ones, some of them are really obvious. The uh, deliberation is dying. We can't productively talk about where we want to go if we don't know where we are. Uh, if we dispute facts of the world, we cannot come up with policies and deliberate in a meaningful way. Um, but there's a couple of other uh, not quite so obvious ramifications. One of them is that scandal is dying. Uh, if you think about scandal for a moment, to uh, actually have an effective change that comes out about because of a scandal, it can't just be that one side of the aisle thinks that something bad happened. There has to be at least some crossover from the other side for a scandal to be effective. Otherwise, people can shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. People won't agree about the facts and nothing can be done. Um, scandal uh, potentially is much less effective than it once was. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is that the influence of the economy on presidential elections we think is going to change tremendously. And the nutshell on this is that most political scientists will tell you that one of the major predictors of presidential success of an incumbent is the state of the economy. You might have seen that Moody's, one of the big investment houses, just put out their report on what they think is going to happen in 2020. And according to Moody's, if you use the standard economic variables, 
uh, is the economy doing well in terms of unemployment, stock market, gross domestic product? Uh, Trump's going to win straight down the line on all of the economic models because an incumbent with a powerful economy wins. That's not necessarily true if we don't agree on the facts of the economy. If you have one side that sees the economy positively because they want to, and another side that sees the economy negatively because they want to, the old measures of reality may no longer at all predict what is going to happen. Yeah, and let me jump in on that. So more, uh, even more broadly than that, right, uh, this raises questions of democratic accountability, right? I mean, uh, you know, the way democracy works is that people campaign and they say they're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then they get elected and then people pay attention and, and they see whether or not X, Y, or Z happens, and then they either reward them or punish them for that performance in, in office. But if there's no such thing anymore uh, as an objective evaluation of what someone has done while they are in office, if people choose to believe um, any, you know, one set of things and the other side chooses to believe another set of things, then there's no coming together uh, as an electorate uh, and holding people accountable uh, for what they've done in office. And it's you know, highly questionable as to whether or not um, economic performance ever should have been the thing uh, that voters use to punish or reward incumbent presidents, given that incumbent presidents probably have limited control over the short-term fortunes of the economy. But uh, historically, that has been something that has mm -hmm. happened. Uh, and uh, there's every reason to believe now uh, that that's not going to continue uh, to, to be um, something that, uh, that, that works to predict outcomes in the future. What do you think has changed with regards to that? Because I, as you guys talk about that, I think about how in my college government classes, as of 10 years ago, we were still debating whether or not Reaganomics was successful. So it feels almost kind of like a similar thing. So what are the big differences between how the economy was viewed during Reagan or even during Clinton, where you did have facts showing a positive trend in the economy and all the metrics that used by the left and right seem to agree that both both administrations were fairly successful with the economy. What's changed between then and now that there's no longer yeah. any sort of... Yeah. This, this has to do with this concept of intuitive epistemology that we mentioned before. Um, there's a lot of background to what Dave and I are saying are the new changes. One of the questions that we get is about, well, are you saying that the psychology is different? We're actually not. Uh, the psychology has been pretty stable. We've always had selective perception. We've always had motivated reasoning. We've always, always had selective memory. Uh, but we haven't always had polarization. Uh, when people's values become different, uh, split to such a degree, then the psychological mechanisms ramp up in a certain way. You can also uh, say there was a big role of the media split. And there was a big role of technology on the internet. And those two other things along with polarization, polarization, media bifurcation, um, social media explosion. But you know, the thing about the media bifurcation and the social media explosion, those were also driven by polarization. Uh, th they were serving what people wanted and what people wanted was to see things that they liked and complain about things that they didn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in regard to the economy, let me just say the intuitive epistemology part. That, um, in regard to the economy, uh, intuitive epistemology is the argument that depending on which values you really have, what you think is good and bad, you actually want to see different good and bad things in the world. And what that means is you can go by the old assumption that people have a similar epistemology. They ask what is there in the world and liberals and conservatives ask the same question. We find that they actually don't. If you ask people uh, just from a neutral point without telling them what you're talking about, uh, a series of questions that they would habitually use or want answers to, you find people ask different questions when they look at the world and they're directly related to their values. So on the economy, uh, you can ask two different questions about the current economy. What, conservative, what conservatives ask is, is the economy writ large performing well? Is unemployment down? Is the aggregate economy producing? The answer is yes, therefore the economy is good. What liberals tend to ask is not that question. They tend to ask, is the economy performing for vulnerable people? Is the economy performing for poor people? Is the economy producing fairness? And that's why Elizabeth Warren, without any uh, indication that she's not saying exactly what she believes to be true, is saying that the economy right now is bad because her question says it's bad. And if our intuitive epistemologies are different, 
uh, it's not the 90s under Clinton where Republicans and Democrats agreed that it was a good economy. They don't anymore, looking at the exact same data. My screen froze. We can still hear you. You're good now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can still hear me? Yeah. yeah you look good now. Okay, because my, my screen froze, uh, so I wanted, I wanted to make sure. Sorry about that. Uh, just to, uh, to jump in, like I said, Morgan froze when he was talking, so I'm not sure uh, what I may have, have missed. But um, the, uh, as Morgan was saying, people can choose to focus on the different facts as they relate to the economy in relation to these different questions that they ask. And so while on the one hand, it is objectively true that the um, state of the economy by many metrics is stronger um, maybe than it ever has been since we've been measuring it, certainly when it comes to the unemployment rate, uh, that's true. Um, a separate question is whether or not the rate of improvement in that economy has actually hastened under Trump or not. And it hasn't, right? And so uh, if you're a liberal, who wants to believe that the economy has not improved, you can say, well, the economy was already getting better for a long time. Trump came in and continued to get better. And so now objectively, we're finally at this place where it's objectively good, but it hasn't gotten any you know, better uh, in terms of a rate of change point of view. The other thing you can, you can do, as, as Morgan pointed out, uh, and as uh, liberal Democrats routinely do, is to point out that, that um, the economy is strong, but for whom, right? That it is not nearly as strong for people in the bottom half uh, of the, um, of the, of the um, economic distribution as it is, frankly, for people in the, the top 10%. I mean, that's been true for a long time, right? Not just over the course of the past uh, few years. But the point is, is that all of these things are out there and, and they're all true. And the difference, so again, it's not about misinformation, right? Because all, each of these things are true. Um, but we also now have media that will choose to emphasize one thing or the other. And uh, in the past, when we had three networks or even just you know, a little bit of cable news, but a lot of Americans still trusted the media and other sources of informational authority, they would learn through that, that media that the economy was strong. And they would think, oh, okay, well, I guess the incumbent is doing a good job. Uh, but now, uh, no one trusts the media except for the particular websites and particular channels and particular programs that they choose to, to go on to. And so anything that, that happens on, on those other places is irrelevant. Yeah. Let me say a word about trust. And then this dovetails. I still uh, want a day to come back uh, to the Bob studies, right. which are about trust of other people. Uh, but about trust of institutions and authority. This is part of the polarization story. And again, uh, this is not something that is directly about doing fact perceptions and the psychology that Dave and I worked out. This is the background to it. And the, and the background is that trust has collapsed in the last decades. Trust of uh, uh, important institutions, trust of politicians, trust of media, uh, and trust in one media but not uh, another uh, mm. branch. Uh, perhaps the most important part of trust that has declined so much, though, is trust in academia trust in scholars as the producers of legitimate knowledge. If you look at the recent Pew studies on this and the surveys, it, it, it's, it's shocking. Anyone uh, listening to this who hasn't seen these yet, I really recommend taking a quick look at them. Uh, because when you realize how much conservatives and Republicans have stopped trusting academia, I mean, one of the chapters of One Nation, Two Realities, Dave and I look at some of the data on this and, and why this is, and it is unquestionably directly driven by perceptions of the ideological balance of academia. Uh, one of the really shocking things in the book is that if you look up all the academic knowledge on academic dispersion, which is that the, the studies of scholars on the ideological balance of scholars, uh, they all say the same thing. The answer is five to one. It's, it's five to one liberal conservative, Democrat to Republican across universities. Of course, it, it varies by schools, it varies by departments. It's five to one. If you ask liberals and conservatives what their perception of it is, you would think, oh, liberals probably think it's lower than five to one. 
maybe they'll say it's one or two to one, which is what they say. And you say, oh, conservatives probably think it's more than five to one. That's actually not right. Conservatives think that it's higher than liberals do, but they think it's about three to one. They still think it's lower than actually it is. But if they knew that it really was five to one, they would trust academia even less. And you can show in the data very clearly, uh, the higher people think the ratio of liberals to conservative faculty are, the less they trust academia. And if the producers of knowledge are not trusted, then people can just think whatever they want. They, they're, they're freed. They can think uh, whatever they see on the internet is real. They can fill in the blanks however they want. And what our evidence shows is how they fill in that blank when trust is gone in traditional sources of the answer. They fill it in with the things that match their values. And it's not just their partisanship, it's their values. Like uh, anti-vaxxers, by the way, that's not a partisan thing, that's value driven. Anti-vaxxers are Democrats and Republicans. It's driven by their values because they don't trust what people, what thing, they don't trust the things that people like uh, Dave and I say. And that is a problem. Yeah, and so I just realized that we uh, went backwards in our response to your question. You you asked us about um, the social consequences, and you said you were then going to ask us about the political consequences. And we've gone ahead and given you uh, talked about the political consequences. Uh, let me go ahead and and go backwards then and and respond to your original question uh, about the social consequences, which are are not as obvious, uh, but Morgan has alluded to them. So. Uh, we did these experiments where we exposed people to uh, a fictional Twitter account uh, by a guy uh, named Bob Stratford, which is the most milk toast name that we could come up with. Uh, and we gave him- oh, Apologies to Bob Stratford out in yeah. the world. <laughs> yeah, and we gave him a Twitter feed where he talks about how much he likes the Beatles and how much he enjoys to make pancakes on the weekends and, and how much he like enjoys Downton Abbey and stuff like that. Uh, but mixed into the middle there, uh, we had him uh, say one of three things. Uh, we had him express um, uh, a fact perception on a controversial issue such as climate change uh, that either sort of, you know, says that, um, you know, essentially denies climate change, right, uh, or supports it. And then the third experimental condition was a, a neutral one. Well, it wasn't a neutral one, but it was a comparison group or we had uh, Bob talk about how much he either likes Democrats or Republicans, right? So the, the idea is that we wanted to find out uh, what the consequences are to being exposed to someone uh, say something that, that is different from what you believe to be factually true and whether that causes you to respond to that person in a different way than you would respond just by learning that that person uh, is of a different political party than you. Uh, to find out if this factual polarization actually causes even greater social uh, consequences than just partisan polarization. And what we found is that when people uh, are observed or um, exposed to Bob, disagreeing with them on the facts, they are much more likely to say that they would not be willing to eat lunch with Bob, they would not be willing to work on a project with Bob, uh, they would not, you know, they'd say things like he's stupid and, and shady and ignorant. Uh, and so the affective polarization that corresponds with just finding out that somebody happens to disagree with you about climate change are really quite dramatic. Uh, and we think that this um, translates into a, a spiraling type of, of political polarization where political polarization is one of the things that caused us to, to get into the situation in the first place. But now that we're in this situation, it's making that political and social uh, polarization that much worse. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, I kind of want to return to something Morgan was talking about just briefly. So the idea that, um, you know, there's a mistrust of intellectuals yeah. and how people's then own preconceived notions will just allow them to make up their own conclusions. And is that a problem? I mean, yeah. so let's logically extend that then. If we all do that, isn't there then inherently a problem with it being five to one liberal to conservative? Uh, well, you're asking a, a lot of very important questions here. Uh, if we don't have a gatekeeper in the way that we used to, scholars used to serve as gatekeepers, a lot of fact perceptions. Media people like Cronkite used to serve as a gatekeeper. 
when those are gone and the internet blows up, which is just filled with whatever you want to find, and people are freed to use their education to just find what they want to find. And this is when we left this out in going into the other uh, pessimistic uh, findings. It's very clear that all of the projection of your preferred values onto your perceived facts, that basic dynamic that people project their preferred values onto their perceived facts, the more educated you are, the more that becomes stronger. Educated people don't do it less. They don't go to what the faculty say or what legitimate scientists say. They are better at using all of their resources to believe whatever they want to believe. Uh, one of the things that used to rein that in was some degree of respect for faculty. Uh, my mentor, Mark Perlman, he was at Columbia in the 1950s. And he used to argue that at that time, when people wanted to know something, media people, uh, they came to faculty. And faculty had this tremendous outsized influence in terms of how the culture understood things. And you can argue that's good or bad that we went to these people, but we used to have arbiters and we don't have that anymore. And one of the reasons is the lack of trust. Uh, the other question you ask is, does it matter that academia is five to one, liberals to conservatives? The answer is absolutely. It strenuously matters. It is a terrible, terrible thing. Now, I, this is my personal view. Dave might see it a little bit differently, but it has led to a deep sense of distrust because people are aware of it. And if you said to anyone on the left, uh, do you believe the facts coming out of the Heritage Foundation? Do you believe the facts coming out of um, American Enterprise Institute that is five to one conservative or more? They don't believe facts out of AEI. They don't believe facts out of Cato or Heritage. And uh, half of America no longer believes the facts that come out of academia. That is a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of research on this by uh, Jonathan Haidt in uh, psychology, Phil Tadlock in psychology. Uh, the effects on trust, uh, there are many other negative effects, but the effects on trust are the worst ones that are having this consequence. Yeah, let me jump in here to reiterate this point as, as well and maybe put it uh, slightly differently, uh, which is to, to say that, like, look, none of us have the time to actually know what the facts are with respect to most things, right? We just don't, we can't. We have no choice as citizens, as people, but to rely on some trusted authority to tell us what we should think is true when it comes to all kinds of stuff, right? And so traditionally those gatekeepers, those gatekeepers, those informational authorities have been scientists. They have been university um, professors. Uh, so, Without those gatekeepers, right? It's a free for all, right? When there are no gatekeepers, then anybody, it, it's chaos, right? It's, it's Lord of the Flies. Um, and so, therefore, we need universities to be able to perform this function of being gatekeepers, but they currently can't because half the country doesn't trust them. And why don't they trust them? because they perceive them all to be liberally biased. And, and why do they perceive them to be liberally biased? Because they are, right? And that doesn't mean that it's some sort of conspiracy or that, that people, you know, sitting next to us uh, down the hall and, and whatever are trying to, you know, spread propaganda of our own and twist the minds of youth and, and trying to, you know, turn them all into good little Democrats or something like that, no. It just means that all human beings bring their, their own, again, they bring their own values into the, their work and their, and their lives. And so when it happens to be the case, uh, for any number of reasons that we could go into, the things that draw people into this line of work, when it happens to be the, the case that um, the academy is overwhelmingly liberal or, or progressive, then those values are going to be reflected in the product uh, that goes out. And unless academia finds a way uh, to change that, uh, they're going to com completely lose half the country. And, and the consequences could be even greater than what we're talking about if Republican and conservative parents all over the country start just refusing to send their kids to traditional institutions of higher learning, given that those traditional institutions of higher learning are the only way people can succeed in life. And so, um, so yeah, it's a big problem. Yeah, and then, and then of course the 
who guards the guardians, <laughs> if, if there even was an equitable <laughs> breakdown yeah. partisan wise. But um, so we have a couple of minutes left. I want to talk about the correctives. So that's yeah. something you guys discuss a lot in the book. What are the correctives for all of this? Is, should, yeah. How concerned should we be? Concerned. Uh, that was the one that troubled us the most on this, that um, we originally had some optimism that some of the major correctives could work. Uh, and there's a demand in scholarship that I fully understand that a book of this nature, they do want a couple of chapters at the end explaining what we can do about this and how it can be fixed. Uh, and that, that's not how this book ends. Uh, there, there are two big correctives that have been offered. People talk about a lot, a lot of scholars have looked into. We hope there are other ones. We haven't found other ones yet. And that's really one of the pitches here that we need to look to other ones. And the two big ones are education and fact checking. Education, for the reasons that we were just talking about, does not work. Uh, and the, other, the, the biggest reason education doesn't work is that it gives people greater cognitive skills to selectively find and process and remember information. Uh, there's no question, and this is not just our finding. All the scholars who've looked at this have found to their chagrin that the more educated someone is, the better they are at projecting their priors into their perceptions. The other really disappointing one is fact-checking. Uh, Dave can say more about this, but the, the, the central nutshell is that it doesn't work. The, the people who should be looking at fact-checks don't look at it, and the ones who do process it in very biased ways, and they accept the ones that accord with their values, and they reject the ones that do not accord with their values. Uh, one of the real problems, and, and <clears throat> let me say my nutshell criticism of the fact-checking industry. Uh, we uh, mentioned a quote in the book that comes from one of the famous major fact checkers. And uh, what he said during a training session of junior fact checkers in the industry was, I believe fact checking is good and I believe it works. And if you have any evidence that it doesn't work, I don't wanna hear about it. Uh, and that is the attitude of the fact checking industry. They, they think on a moral plane that what they're doing is good. They do not look at the facts about fact checking. They do not look at the evidence of whether it works or doesn't work. Our studies and all the other studies, not all, most of the other studies have shown that fact checking does not have positive results in changing misperceptions. Uh, that alone is a deep failing of what is happening here. It may be the case, be also, the case also that, that suddenly I'm hearing myself. Yeah, I'm hearing myself. I don't know if there's a way to fix it. Oh, Morgan, can you? Morgan, can you? There might be take the feedback. Hello? What? We can hear you, Dave. Okay, great. Uh, even if the fact-checking industry were perfect, even if it did not have uh, any of the shortcomings that uh, Morgan uh, just briefly alluded to and that we write about, uh, it's probably the case that that uh, the, the public would distrusted and, and not listen to it and not respond to it uh, anyway. Um, and for many of the same reasons that they're, that the public's not persuaded by factual information from sources that they don't trust, period, right? And, and indeed, uh, in our book and in many other studies, uh, there is a consistent finding by communication scholars and political scientists and psychologists, which is that not only does fact checking rarely uh, convince people to change their, their mind and, and, and believe the quote unquote truth, um, but it sometimes backfires. So it is, it is not uncommon to hold a false belief and then have a fact checker correct you, even with undeniable evidence, right? Something that you can't really question if you're an honest minded person. Uh, and then to have the recipient uh, of that information not only not be persuaded, but to actually believe the incorrect thing more firmly than they did to begin with, uh, and to dig in, to entrench themselves in that misperception. And so that's really disturbing, right? Because again, it suggests, uh, what are we going to do about this? Uh, we wind up reaching a very pessimistic conclusion, which is that this is going to get worse before it gets better, and it may never get better. And um, democracy itself, the idea of it, this great experiment and self-governance may crumble. Interesting. Um, so a final question 
from me is just what's the symmetry from both the left and the right when discussing this issue? Are we seeing it kind of equally from both sides? And how do you think that will shake out in 2020? You should talk. Well, let me, um, let me say a brief word, but I think Dave should take this one. That um, there's a large assumption that this is driven by conservative misperceptions. And simply, that is not what we have found or what other people have found in this. Uh, and this is, by the way, we're saying that uh, Dave and I are unafraid to write and publish things that seemingly come to conclusions that conservatives would applaud and like. But I don't want the audience to think that it's the case that we're just conservatives saying that. That, that is not actually the case here. Uh, that's not uh, what's going on and, and what is um, driving this. Uh, but um, uh, Dave can tell you that there's tremendous evidence of symmetry rather than asymmetry here. Yeah, so um, there's a few different things to, to say here. When you talk about like, is it more on the left or the, or the right? Uh, there's a few different ways to, to slice that, right? And so the, even though our book is not necessarily a, a, about misinformation strictly, right? We said that we're not here to, to keep score. Um, it is the case that on a couple of very high profile uh, issues that tend to get a lot of media attention, and by the way, maybe it's not a coincidence that they tend to get a lot of media attention, uh, the highest profile one being climate change, um, right? Uh, the, the left, right, has that one on their side, and I think that this, this drives the broader feeling or understanding that Republicans just must be inclined to want to misperceive reality in a way that the Democrats are not. I think Stephen Colbert uh, once famously said that the truth has a well-known liberal bias, right? Uh, and I think, again, because um, climate change gets, and, you know, Republican opposition to it gets so much publicity, that, that becomes sort of deep-seated and, and entrenched uh, on the left. And, and you see that then expressed in, in some degree of smug condescension uh, on the left toward, uh, toward people who disagree with them on the facts. But if you look more broadly, right, not at just one or two issues, but if you look across the 15 or 17 issues uh, that we have looked at uh, in this book, things like, again, um, well, we haven't mentioned them yet, right, but uh, whether or not undocumented immigration is, is either good or bad for the working class uh, and the economy in the, in the U.S., whether or not the minimum wage or increase in the minimum wage helps or hurts working class uh, people who are trying to, to sustain themselves on that, that wage and, and have jobs. Things like uh, whether free trade is ultimately good or bad, whether the national debt ultimately uh, is catastrophic for the economy or not, whether marijuana is harmful or not, whether or not breastfeeding is good or bad, well, you know, on and on and on and on and on, right? Uh, what we find is that people on the left and the right are about equally uh, inclined to project their values on, onto facts. Uh, furthermore, when it comes to the consequences, when it comes to this um, uh, tendency to, uh, to really despise people uh, and, and who disagree with you on the facts, right? The so social consequences and the Bob studies that we were talking about, we find that not only is that not worse on the right, it's not even 50-50, um, uh, it's actually considerably worse on the left, right? So what we find is that, that um, the disdain uh, that people feel toward others who disagree with them on the facts uh, is weighted toward the left. It's worse on the left. And so um, we think those are important things to point out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then just finally, can you, how do you both feel about how this is going to sh shape the rhetoric in the 2020 election? Will we see this kind of on parade <laughs> throughout? <laughs> yes, is the short uh, version of that. Uh, Dave mentioned a lot of the big hitters. The, uh, I was thinking just before this of which ones I think will be most important in the 2020 campaign. Uh, clearly climate change will be, state of the economy will be, uh, uh, guns will be, the national debt, immigration, all of these things. Um, one note about climate change that's fascinating uh, in the blog for Psychology Today that Dave and I do, we did a couple pieces on how it really isn't just the case any longer 
that there's a conservative and a liberal perception. Uh, many viewers will be familiar uh, with Yang's views on this. Uh, Andrew Yang has famously come out saying that the liberal consensus that climate change, of course, is bad and we can fix it. Uh, what the science says as he reads it is that it's really very, very bad and we cannot fix it. We should actually listen to the scientists who say, abandon trying to stop it, put all of your energy into adaptation. And these are two very different views on this. Michael Franzen, a uh, 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 famous author, has also written a really influential problematic piece in The New Yorker about this. Uh, so even within one side of the political debate, facts are fracturing, fracturing. About the national debt, even on the Democratic side, tremendous disagreement between Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren about how bad the debt is. And Biden agrees with the perceptions of the 1990s. Uh, here in New Hampshire, where I'm right now, the Concord Coalition is the anti-debt interest group, founded by Warren Rudman on the right, but very importantly, by Paul Songus on the left. And in the 90s, Clinton and Songus thought that the debt was just horrible. As Clinton famously said, it's math. Okay, you can't disagree with math. It's going, the chickens are coming home to roost. Biden still believes that because he's from that era. Warren does not believe that. The debt is not bad. And uh, I think where we're headed to uh, give you the bottom line answer, I very much agree with Dave that um, the politicians are almost free to say whatever perceptions they want because they can forge agreement regardless of what scholars say or media people say or scientists say. There is a, a free, there's a factual freedom that we have not seen before in American politics. It yeah. is new and different. Yeah, that's um, I think it is deeply destructive, and I think it is going to get way worse before it ever gets better. Yeah, that's the, the thing that I was going to say as it relates to 2020 and the, the campaign rhetoric and the ads and the debates and everything else that we're going to, going to see is that there's just no penalty whatsoever for bald face lying anymore. None. There's zero. There's zero disincentive to just say whatever you want about anything because you're not going to face any consequences for it. And, um, and that, you know, changes the way politicians campaign, right? It also means that uh, you're not going to score any points for trying to be honest, right? Not only are you not going to be penalized for lying, but you may be penalized for trying to be honest and objective and, and try to like acknowledge certain truths that that you know your opponents may may hold uh, because the name of the game now is mobilizing people who are already in your camp and making sure they show up on election day persuasion is dead right and when i say that i don't mean i don't want to overstate it there's probably five to seven percent of the electorate who can possibly be persuaded now those people matter right because we're in a an almost like a 50 50 democratic to republican uh type of ratio in the country and so those five percent percent of people in the middle uh, matter. But, um, but even those people, you're not going to win them over through reasoned, um, objective uh, analyses and, and uh, pointing to, to facts, because the 5% who can be persuaded tend to be the people who actually pay almost no attention and know uh, almost nothing, right? And they're not going to know the difference whether you're lying to them or telling them the truth. So you might as well lie. Because if you if you lie, you might win them over, and 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 you can rest assured that you'll at least make your own people happy, right? And uh, and I think I expect that's the way things are going to shake out in 2020. Well, this is a lot to chew on as we head into our last few weeks before the first couple of presidential primaries. But um, thank you both so much for joining us today. And again, the book is called One Nation, Two Realities: Dueling Facts in American Democracy. And it can be purchased at everywhere you purchase books. Um, but thank you both so much for joining. Um, it was great to, to chat about this today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. All right. And headaboutpedia.org if you have any questions or comments about this. I can also be reached at editor at ballotpedia.org if you have any suggestions for future installments of Ballotpedia Insights. And we'll talk to everybody again in two months. Have All a great right. day. Bye. Bye.